Good morning. My name is Taylor Sutton. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, I'd invite you now to join me in prayer before we look at God's Word together. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would show us your glory over the next several minutes as we seek to behold it with our hearts and minds through your word. Amen. Over the last several months, we've been studying the book of Leviticus together. And this morning, we pause that series in order to spend a few weeks thinking about Advent from the book of Hebrews. So you can turn there if you would like. Hebrews chapter 7 is where we will be this morning. So we'll be looking at Hebrews over the next several weeks, thinking about Advent, the coming of Jesus. But as it turns out, we will not be leaving Leviticus entirely behind because what the book of Hebrews does so powerfully is it shows us the glory of Christ through the the prism of the law of Moses. And that might sound uh, a bit abstract or academic, but I, I think that that actually gets at the heart of what Advent is about. In the season of Advent, the the idea, at least traditionally, is that we are really living in, soaking in that sense of anticipation for the coming of Jesus. And Hebrews helps us see why. Why Jesus came after centuries of anticipation. Uh, One of the things that can happen, I think one of the dangers that we face, not just at Advent, but certainly uh, at Advent as well, is that Jesus and his coming can seem trite or even maybe sentimental when we view him in isolation from the history that preceded him. When When you cut Jesus off in your own view of him, from the story that led up to his birth in Bethlehem, you, you miss a lot. Uh, for those of you, those few poor souls who have not seen the movie Hoosiers, uh, if I were to show you that, that famous uh, goosebump creating scene where Jimmy Chitwood hits the winning shot in the state championship game, if you were to see that scene... As dramatic as it is, you would not really get it. You might be able to gather, okay, that looks important. Uh, People are excited. The music is really dramatic. This looks like a sports movie where, like, some team won. Uh, Okay. So you you would get something, but you would miss so much. You would miss the profound significance of what that event meant for all the characters involved. And so it is with Jesus, that if we just come to Bethlehem and we just start there and we don't see Jesus in the context of the story of Israel, he will start to seem trite and even a bit sentimental. So as we look at Hebrews 7 this morning, we are going to see Jesus. We're going to look at the significance of Christ through the lens of priesthood the lens of priesthood. And my hope for us this morning is that this text would help us see with renewed clarity the beauty of Christ and our need for him. So let's read our text this morning. Hebrews 7, uh, we're going to be looking at verse 11 all the way to verse 28. Hebrews 7, 11 through 28. This is God's word. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order 
of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. And so we see in this passage that Jesus is the greatest priest who has ever lived and the only priest that we will ever need. Jesus is the greatest priest who has ever lived and to this day and for all time, the only priest that you and I will ever need. Now, what is priesthood about? The, the essential idea of priesthood is, is mediation, standing in between God and humanity in order to facilitate some kind of connection, some kind of relationship between the two parties. And the concept of priesthood did not originate with Jesus. As this passage references, God gave Israel priests. We've seen as much in our series on Leviticus. But what the author of Hebrews argues for in this passage is that Jesus is a better priest. Or, or to expand that a little bit, Jesus has come to fulfill and even surpass the function of Israel's original priests. And the author of Hebrews makes this argument by giving us four ways, four arguments as to why Jesus is a better priest than the priests from the tribe of Levi, the priests who were descended from Aaron. So that's how we'll walk through this passage this morning. We'll look at each of these four arguments for the superiority of the priesthood of Jesus to the priesthood of the Levites. So let's 
look at the text together. The first argument is this. Jesus is a better priest because he belongs to a better order of priests. Jesus is a better priest. How do we know that? Because he belongs to a better order of priests. And this first argument takes up verses 11 to 19. So look at the text with me. Verse 11. It says this, Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Now, to grasp the argument that the writer is making here, we have to take a step back and first realize that we're, we're dropping in midstream as far as the flow of thought is concerned. This uh, argument really started back in chapter 5. You can flip back just for a moment to Hebrews 5, verse 5. This is where the idea of Jesus as a better priest starts in the book of Hebrews. It started in, at the end of chapter 4, actually. But look at chapter 5, verse 5. He says, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him, who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of of Melchizedek. And it's that last citation, that last verse, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, that really most of chapter 7 then takes up and expounds upon. So what's going on with this verse? This is from Psalm 110, which is a psalm in which God speaks essentially to the Messiah in advance. He, he speaks to David's son who would become David's Lord and says things like, you, uh, I, I put your uh, enemies, I make your enemies your footstool. And he also says in Psalm 110, verse 4, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what's the significance of that? Well, the Messiah was widely understood to be a royal figure. The Messiah is the anointed, promised king descended from David. What Psalm 110 adds to that picture is that this king will also be a priest. This king will also be a priest uh, in line with the order of Melchizedek. Now, what's going on with Melchizedek? Well, Melchizedek shows up one other time in Genesis 14, where he's identified as the king of Salem and also a priest of the Most High God, and he blesses Abraham, which Hebrews talks about uh, right before our passage. The significance of that is most simply this, that Melchizedek was both king and priest. And so the Messiah, too, would be a king and a priest. And what's interesting is that Melchizedek was king of ancient, ancient, ancient Jerusalem. That's what Salem was. So there was an ancient king long before Israel was even a thing. There was a king of Jerusalem who was also a priest of the Most High God. And the Lord says in Psalm 110 to the Messiah you will fulfill that calling to be a king and a priest. So come back now to Hebrews 7, verse 11. To understand what this is saying, we have to keep these two points in history in mind. The first point is that at Mount Sinai, God gave Israel priests. The, the Levites, the descendants of Aaron, those were God given priests to Israel. So that's the first point we have to keep in mind. The second point is the giving of the promise in Psalm 110. So centuries after priests are given, a promise is given that there will be a king who will be a different kind of priest. So now look at verse 11. Again, the inference that the author makes from those two historical points is simply this, that it, the, the fact that God made a promise after he had already given priests indicates, demonstrates that those original priests were not the final 
answer, that a better kind of priest was needed. Otherwise, why would God make such a promise centuries after he had already given them priests? And he goes on to say it's not merely that God is swapping out one order of priesthood for another while leaving the the covenant that structured his relationship with Israel intact. The, The argument is that a new priesthood means, by definition, a whole new covenant. Look at how he puts it in verse 18. So he says in verse 18, On the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is, is introduced through which we draw near to God. So notice the contrast that he's making. On the one hand, you have the law of Moses with the Levitical priesthood that it created and structured and governed. And the writer to the Hebrews is pointing out that law as perfect and righteous and God-ordained as it was, was not given the power to solve the moral corruption of humanity. It was powerless to make men and women whole or perfect, as he puts it in verse 19. On the other hand, we now have Jesus, a better priest from a better order of priests, who, whose coming coincides with, is connected to the giving of a better covenant. A better hope is now introduced through which we draw near to God. When you have a problem with your car, which I hope none of you do, but when you have a problem with your car, there's a threshold for most of us at which point we say, I'm going to have to pay somebody else to deal with this. Now, for some of us, the threshold is very low. Uh, I would be among that number. Uh, once you get past like jumping a battery or changing an air filter, it's time to hire a professional. But others of you, you can do more. Uh, you could maybe change the, the, the brakes on a car. You change your own oil. But then even those brave souls among us, they, they, they hit their threshold as well, don't they? Where you have to bring the car to a professional. Well, I had an experience about a year ago where I hit another threshold, and it was this. Uh, I have a hybrid car, and the high-voltage battery went out. And all you need to know about that is the high-voltage battery is like the second engine. It's apparently, as it turns out, a big deal to change <laughs> the high-voltage battery. Uh, it's, it's expensive. So the part itself is really expensive. But also, the, the labor to switch out high-voltage batteries is really complicated. I, I was told, I discovered, that the mechanics have to wear like special protective gear when they're dealing with the installation of these batteries. So I found out, I found out in comparing quotes that there were mechanics, there were shops that wouldn't even do it. They said, sorry, we, we don't do that. So the point is this, that there comes a time, there, there are problems that are severe enough, complicated enough, that you need to bring in someone with higher expertise, with a a greater capacity to solve the problem. And what Hebrews 7, 11 through 19 is saying is that was the situation that humanity found ourselves in as it relates to sin and our alienation from God. We are at the point where none of us can fix the problem. Even if God designates some group of us to be priests under his covenant, they can't actually solve the problem. A better order of priests is needed. And Jesus belongs to that better order. So that's the first argument we see in this text. The second argument is this, that Jesus is a better priest because he was installed in his office, by an oath from God. This is uh, verses 20 through 22. Jesus is a better priest 
because he was installed in his priestly office by means of a divine oath. Look at verse 20. And it was not without an oath. And here comes another contrast. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, and here we get Psalm 110, verse 4, once again, the Lord has sworn. So there's that oath. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So what the writer to the Hebrews is pointing out is that when we look at the priesthood of Jesus, appointed, according to Psalm 110, uh, in the order of Melchizedek, the basis for his priestly installation is a sacred promise from God. God himself swore through Psalm 110 that this Messiah, who would be king of Jerusalem and also priest of the Most High God, that came from an oath. And the contrast is that there was no corresponding oath for the Levitical priests. There was no uh, similar divine vow that undergirded their priesthood. You know, it's fascinating uh, for how much it can feel like uh, marriage is under attack and it's being downgraded and people don't appreciate it anymore. Isn't it interesting that people keep getting married? Like so many people keep getting married, even though uh, the divorce rate is still high. And for many people, marriage has been severely downgraded from a sacred institution to just a personal subjective choice. But even with all of that, even the most irreligious person can see that a relationship is far more substantial and, and solid when it is backed up by legally binding vows. Anyone can see that. And that's why even, even today, if you have a, a couple and the guy says to the girl, uh, I love you, I love you with an undying love, but I, I don't want to I don't want to officially like pledge my life to you. That's a little bit unnecessary. Even the most secular person uh, is going to raise an eyebrow at that. Well, how, how undying is that love if it's not willing to be secured with binding, solemn promises? We recognize that there's something different about that kind of relationship. And what the writer to the Hebrews is saying is this priesthood is backed by something bigger, deeper, stronger, more transcendent than just command. It's backed by the sworn promise of God himself. So the first reason, the first argument for the superiority of Jesus' priesthood is that he belongs to a better order of priests. Second, Jesus is a better priest because his installation in his office comes about through an oath from God. Now, the third argument. Jesus is a better priest because he will never die. Jesus is a better priest because he will never die. We see this third argument in verses 23 through 25. Look at it with me. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. So once again, we have this profound contrast. Under the law of Moses, you had to keep installing new priests because priests keep dying. They're mortals, just like the rest of us, just like the rest of the nation of Israel. So no priest, even a high priest, is able to continue on his ministry mediating between the people and God Permanently, because death cuts 
their ministries short. And how different it is with Jesus. Verse 24 says, Jesus is able to fulfill his priestly ministry. What does it say? Permanently. Permanently because he himself, he continues forever. So like the Old Testament priest, Jesus too died. He went down into the grave of human mortality. But in the resurrection, he comes out the other side. He comes out the other side into a mode of living that is indestructible. He will never die again. And so now what we have is we have a high priest who is alive never to die again. Again, and so his work on our behalf to be our mediator, to be our our go-between between between us and God, that work never gets interrupted. It never gets cut short. It will never be incomplete because he never dies. And look at the conclusion in verse 25. What a great statement this is. Consequently, he is able to save To the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I mean, we could spend all morning just on that verse, but think about this. Because Jesus is alive, he has an ongoing priestly ministry for you and for me and for every believer today. If you're trusting in Christ, Jesus is thinking about you today. If you belong to him through faith, Jesus is praying for you today. We rightly admire all kinds of historical figures, and we're thankful for them because so many figures in history have secured benefits that we continue to enjoy. So we remember and we celebrate, as Protestants at least, Martin Luther, because we believe that he recovered and and helped recover the gospel of grace. Uh, In America, we celebrate Frederick Douglass because he fought, like few others did, for the end of slavery and the establishment of real human equality. We celebrate the Wright brothers who pioneered human flight We celebrate Andrew Fleming, who discovered penicillin. But as much as we enjoy the benefits that come down to us through time from these figures, none of them can do anything for us today. They're not thinking about you. They're not not continuing to do anything for you. But with Jesus, not only did he die And rise again 2,000 years ago. But he lives now to continue to appeal to God the Father on your behalf in light of, on the basis of, that work that he did in history. Charity Lee's Bancroft wrote a hymn that we still sing today back in the 1860s. And it says this, Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. And in the end of that, that first stanza, here's the conclusion. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me from there to leave. As long as my high priest is in the presence of God the Father, pleading his own finished work, pointing to me, saying, that one's mine, I have utter confidence because I have a high priest who lives always to plead for me. No other priest, no other mediator, no other figure or leader comes even close to that. So Jesus is a better priest because he never dies. 
Lastly, fourth argument. Jesus is a better priest because he never sinned. Jesus is a better priest because he never sinned. Look at verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. When God gave Israel their priests, he had to give them sinners as priests. Those were the only options. And so we see in Leviticus in particular, we see all the provisions that had to be included in the law in order to deal with the fact that Israel's own mediators were just as sinful as they were. And what this last argument of chapter 7 points out is the fact that Jesus comes with no such deficiency makes him a better priest because he has no need to deal with his own sin before a holy God. He is able to go way past that and deal once and for all with our sin. And so we're reminded here of two very simple things about Jesus that are absolutely essential and absolutely incredible. The two things are that Jesus is one of us. And second, Jesus is not a sinner like we are. And friends, we need him to be both of those things. And it is amazing and worthy of worship that he is both of those things. He is one of us. So he can actually represent us. He can actually be a real mediator because he is a human being to this day. But because he is also God, the eternal son of God, he has no moral defect. There is nothing wrong with him when he stands in the presence of a holy God. And so not only is he able to be our mediator, but he's able to successfully execute everything that's required for that office of mediator because he's perfect, righteous, without sin. That's the kind of savior that we celebrate at Advent. So Jesus is better as a priest because he belongs to a better order of priests. He's a better priest because his installation to his office was through an oath from God. He's a better priest because he never dies. He will never die, and he's a better priest because he's never sinned. So Jesus is the greatest priest who's ever lived, and he's the only priest we'll ever need. Now, as we think about uh, what does it look like for that reality to get worked out into our lives, I want to consider just two questions with you this morning. The first question is, if Jesus is so much better, why did God bother with thousands of years of the law of Moses? When you read a text like this that is stressing so, uh, so clearly the superiority of the new covenant to the, to the old, the superiority of the last high priest to all the priests that came before him, the, the sneaking suspicion can start to rise up in you of like, what was that all about then? Like, maybe this is just me, but as a child, I, I derived uh, some, some cruel pleasure from like faking out dogs. You ever seen this? You get a ball. You've probably done this, I hope. I hope I'm not the only one. You get a ball, and you get an eager dog ready to fetch it, and then you pretend to throw it, but you don't throw it, and the dog takes off running, and then the, the dog looks, can't find the ball, eventually comes back, and, and you give it to the dog. Is that all the Old Testament is? It's just one giant fake out? 
Like, oh, you thought you needed a tabernacle and priests and sacrifices and uh, this particular land. Nope, just kidding. It was actually this other thing completely unrelated. Is that what God is like? No. And it's not how we should approach the Old Testament either. Uh, There's a lot that could be said about this. Uh, It'll probably come up again in this series, in Leviticus. But let me just say a couple things about that. First of all, we have to remember that in his wisdom, God decided that his redemption of a lost world was best unfolded through history. He didn't, as far as we can tell, have to do it that way. We can conceive of a possible scenario where God does it all at once, in a moment, the full package. But in his wisdom, he viewed it as best to bring his, his healing, restoring redemption gradually across time. And that's not completely incomprehensible to us. That There are foods that taste much better when they are smoked for hours rather than microwaved for, for minutes. We have a category for things that taste better when given time. And it seems, to the degree that we can speculate, it seems that the redemption of a ruined world and lost sinners was somewhat like that. That it is better, that God is more glorified by unfolding his redemption through history. And so we ought not to scoff or to protest at the the years that it took from Adam and Eve to Jesus. Those years were, were purposeful and meaningful. And so corresponding to that, when we come to the Old Testament, we shouldn't think of it like wrapping paper and a, like wrapping a present. As if Jesus is the present, the Old Testament is the wrapping paper, and once we tear it off and we get to the present, we can just leave it behind. We can discard it because we've got the present. Let me suggest a better metaphor would be the Old Testament is like the blueprints and Jesus is the building. So the blueprints are not the final goal. The the goal of architectural drawings is to have a real building. But you don't throw away the drawings when you have a real building because they're still useful. They still show you things about the building that would be hard for you to gather just from looking at the building. And so with the Old Testament, the, the ultimate aim of the Hebrew Scriptures is to glorify Christ. It is to show us the multifaceted glory, beauty, and greatness of the Lord Jesus. And here's what we have to remember. They still do that, even once Jesus has come. In fact, the Old Testament shines a light on Jesus that is different than the light that the New Testament shines on Jesus. It shows us things about him that are not replicated in the New Testament. It's not redundant. So we need the Old Testament, not just to show us the history that led to Jesus, but to give us a unique vantage point for beholding all that makes him glorious and beautiful. That's the first question. Uh, Second question. What does this have to do with daily life? Like, if we believe this, if this takes root in our hearts, what changes? Is this, some might wonder, is this just a religious concept that is only relevant in a religious setting like a church service? And I want to say no. It is not merely religious, if that's what you mean by religious. Think about it this way. All of us go through life grasping for mediators, And if that sounds odd, maybe think of it this way. Ask yourself, what do you stand behind in order to be acceptable? What is it that you stand behind? What what do you put forward to a watching world, to a holy God, to whoever, in order for you to be acceptable? So, When you leave the house or when you walk into a room with people in it, what causes you to hold your head up high and feel good about your standing in the world? 
Is it your good grades? Is it your interesting job? Is it your wealth? Is it your popularity? Is it how your kids are doing? We can look to these things. We can stand behind these things in order for us to be and feel acceptable, to feel okay. And even more profoundly, we all have to stand behind something every day to be and to feel acceptable to God. And for too many of us, we look to, we stand behind our own moral performance to make us okay with God. Now, some of us uh, maybe actually think that. We think, yeah, the reason that God is okay with me is that I'm a good person. Uh, Many of you are too uh, sophisticated in the scriptures to actually say that out loud, but how many of us slip into living that way? Like, as if the thing that really gives us confidence before a holy God is that we had a good week, a good day, spiritually, morally speaking. And what Hebrews 7, 11 through 28 is reminding us is that there is nothing, there is nothing that we can stand behind that ultimately will succeed in making us acceptable. Certainly not our moral performance. We are utterly disqualified from putting forward anything that would be up to the task. And even more so, certainly not our job or our grades or our reputation or our relationships or our money. None of those things at the end of the day are up to the task of making us acceptable. Only Jesus is. And so the great compelling invitation of a passage like this is that there is a better way to live than trying to stand behind flimsy mediators. If you're not yet a Christian and you're considering the Christian faith, this is what it's all about. That there is a Savior like the one this passage describes. You can have this Jesus as your mediator, as your priest, as the one who makes you acceptable. And for for those of you who have already trusted in him, who have taken him as your priest, as your mediator, as your rescuer, this can be a lived, increasing reality. You can go out into the world, yes, thankful for the good things that God has given you, your job, your kids, your reputation. You can be thankful for those things. You can note them. But you can go out into the world with a far deeper confidence humility, and joy than any of those things can ultimately hold up. So we can be, if we will operate as if Jesus really is like this on our behalf, we can live with the kind of joy and humility and confidence that is just impossible any other way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for providing the high priest that we needed and continue to need. Would you help us to day by day, moment by moment, rest in his priestly office and all the mighty things our great high priest has done. We pray even through him alone. Amen.